Well, my work at ORI is on personality and health, for, and I, I do that kind of research for a number of projects. But my, I guess my main passion, the one I'm most invested in, is our study of personality and health, uh, a longitudinal study that is uh, based in Hawaii. It began over between 40 and 50 years ago now, when a colleague of, of ours here at ORI, Jack Digman, studied uh, the personalities of children, elementary school children in Hawaii, and he managed to collect data on their personalities from um, over 2,000 school children. And when he came to ORI, we discussed the possibility of following up on those children. He'd studied them back in the 1960s, and and by now it was the late 1990s, and we, uh, myself and Lou Goldberg and Jack Digman, used to sit around and talk about the possibility, could we ever find these people again? Because if we could, we could study their personalities now, and so we could look at how stable or how much personality changes over time, but also we could do an important piece of research uh, on how personality in childhood affects health outcomes later in life. We were inspired to do that because of a study that had just come out in those, in those days that had showed that childhood personality predicted how long a person lives. So we thought, wow, that is a really amazing finding. And with, with Jack's data, we could study whether personality affects health uh, at, in middle age, which would like be a stepping stone towards explaining why personality in childhood affects uh, how long you can live. So, so that is the goal of that particular project, which has been going on now for, we're in our 15th year, I believe, of funded research to follow up, to find these, what were children 40, 50 years ago, now um, middle-aged um, um, or somewhat older adults, find them, send them questionnaires, um, and even we're doing um, a medical uh, exam, uh, seeing them in person and getting medical information about them also that we can study whether their childhood personalities predict their health outcomes in midlife, both their self-reported health and their objectively clinically assessed health. In particular, uh, we're looking at what are known as the big five personality traits in childhood to see if they predict health outcomes in adulthood. So the big five is really the predominant model of personality at the moment that psychologists are using to describe personality and to assess personality. And it consists of five areas of, that are relatively independent areas of your personality. So, uh, and I'll just go through them. Um, we should all know this. <laughs> uh, extroversion, how extroverted or introverted you are. Agreeableness, the extent to which you're an easy person to get along with or you're a little bit hostile. Um, conscientiousness, the extent to which you're a hard-working, reliable kind of person versus someone who doesn't take doing, uh, doing jobs very seriously and is, um, tends to be late for everything and not very planful. Uh, neuroticism versus emotional stability, so this is, that's probably people have a good lay understanding of that, being anxious, nervous, moody kind of person versus you know, having a very even kind of temperament. And then finally, the last area relates to your your curiosity, and it's called your openness to experience, your kind of interest in all things in the world, and it's somewhat related, in fact, to your cognitive abilities too. People who are who um, people who are intellectually um, developed tend to be more open to experience as well. So those are the five areas of personality, and we assessed, or Jack assessed them in childhood all that time ago, and we're now linking it to adult health outcomes, and in particular, we're interested in that, that the third of those traits, conscientiousness, um, because it's conscientiousness that predicts mortality, how long you live, or how soon you die, and so we are looking at how that can be, how childhood conscientiousness can translate into the way you live your life that can result at middle, at middle age of perhaps having first signs of some serious health problems and that ultimately lead to having a shorter life. Self-control is the term used by, by a number of different kind of investigators uh, interested in different areas of, of, of personality and psychology more generally. And, but I see self-control as, as uh, very, very similar to this idea of conscientiousness. So it, it's the ability of it's measured in young children by tests like seeing how long they can 
not eat a candy that's put out in front of them. Um, and, and even that very simple test predicts subsequent behavior in, in, um, in youth and adulthood. So self-control is proving more and more to be a very important characteristic to develop that children need to develop in order to have successful life, life outcomes. So in my annual review article, I, I in fact simplified the whole the personality model from the big five down to kind of the big three, and self-control is one of those important big three, and, and talked about how self-control uh, has these long-term effects. And, and I think the, the broader implication of, of all this work is that Self-control, it doesn't sound very fun and exciting and, you know, um, the media don't say we should all be self-controlled. Advertising and so on is all about not being self-controlled. Go on, have another, another ice cream, have another candy, have another beer, um, you know, be spontaneous. This is all um, encouraging people not to have self-control. But I think the research shows that, you know, while there's a place for that, Children and young adults need to learn self-control in order to have successful life. It, it impacts their ability to their educational attainment, um, their their health outcomes, things like uh, substance use. It has a wide range of implications for good outcomes. Well, it's telling us that the psychological factors are important in health outcomes as well as medical factors, and I think it's a, there's a growing recognition of the importance of of, of, of the mind-body link, and um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a trend in medicine now which has been developed by the progress in genetics, which is to talk about personalized medicine, that if we know someone's genome, we can predict what diseases they're going to get. But not everybody succumbs to disease, even, I mean, perhaps with very specific genetic susceptibility, yes, they don't have much choice, but, but, um, but some people get ill and some people don't get ill in the same circumstances and, and that's what psychological factors can help us explain. And personalized medicine could include a psychological assessment. It could include assessing people's personality traits, their self-control, maybe their health literacy is another thing people research these days. So if, we, if you went to the doctor and you took a few simple tests, the doctor would then have yet more information in addition to maybe your genetics and your family history and so on that they could use to tailor the medical care that they gave you. So I think that's, that's one example of where this kind of research could, could take us in practical terms.